Chapter 10 of The Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon. The Sea Witch by Murray Macherine Ballou. Chapter 10 The Duel. Affairs in the immediate vicinity of Don Leonardo's residence began to assume a singular and very peculiar aspect. In the first place, there was within doors, and under his immediate roof, four newcomers, nearly each of which was actuated by some contrary purpose or design. Mrs. Huntington was exceedingly desirous to obtain passage up the coast to Sierra Leone, and thence home to England. Her daughter secretly dreaded the approach of the hour that was to separate her from one whom, in her unrevealed heart, she devotedly loved. Captain Ratlin was, of course, all impatience to have the English cruiser up anchor and leave the harbor, her proximity to his own fleet clipper ship being altogether too close, while Captain Bramble felt in no haste to leave the port for several reasons. First, he had a suspicion that he should soon be able to trip up the heels of his rival, as it regarded this business on the coast. And secondly, he was very content to have Miss Huntington remain here, because he knew if she was once landed at Sierra Leone, she would directly sail for England. Don Leonardo heartily wished them all at the bottom of the sea, or any other place except his house, with the exception, of course, of Captain Ratlin, whose business with him was seriously impeded by the presence of these parties. Maud, too, was not a disinterested party, as the reader may well imagine, after the audacious treachery which she had already evinced, but she was comparatively passive now, and seemed quietly to bide her time for accomplishing her second resolve, touching him she once loved but now hated, as well as satisfying her revengeful spirit by the misery or destruction of her rival. We say affairs in Don Leonardo's residence had assumed a singular and peculiar aspect, and the dull routine of everyday life that had characterized the last year was totally changed. The singular coincidence of the meeting between Miss Huntington and her rejected lover, Captain Bramble, under such singular circumstances, led him once more to press this suit, and now, as she regarded him largely in the light of a protector, the widow quite approved of his intimacy, and indeed, as far as propriety would permit, seconded his suit with her daughter. When in India she had looked most favorably upon Captain Bramble's intimacy with her child, where there were accessory circumstances to further her claims, but now she soon told her daughter in private that Captain Bramble was a match fit and proper in all respects for such as she was. But mother, well, my child? Suppose, for instance, that I do not like Captain Bramble, then is he a fitting match for me? Not like him, my child? Yes, mother, not like him. Why, is he not gentlemanly? Yes. And of good family? Undoubtedly. And handsome? And— Hold, mother, you need not extend the catalogue. Captain Bramble can never be my husband, she said in a mild but determined tone that her mother understood very well. But Captain Bramble himself could not seem to understand this, notwithstanding she was perfectly frank and open with him. He seemed to be running away with the idea that if he could but get rid of Captain Ratlin in some way, he should then have a clear field, and be able to win her hand under the peculiar circumstances surrounding her. Thus moved, he redoubled his watchfulness touching the captain's movements, satisfied that he should be able ere long to detect him in some intrigue as to running a cargo of slaves, and doubtless under such circumstances that he could arrest and detain him, if not by some lucky chance, even have him tried and adjudged upon by the English commission upon the coast. To suppose that Captain Ratlin did not understand entirely the motives and conduct of his enemy and would-be rival would be to give him less credit for discernment than he deserved. He understood the matter very well, and indeed bore with assumed patience, for Miss Huntington's sake, many impertinences that he would otherwise have instantly asserted. But he marked out for himself a course, and he resolved to adhere to it. 
Captain Bramble was not only a suitor of Miss Huntington's, but an old and intimate friend, as he learned from her family, and therefore he should avoid all quarrel whatever with him, and so he did on his own part. But the English officer, enraged by his apparent success, took every occasion to disparage the character of Captain Ratlin, and even before Miss Huntington's own face declared him no gentleman. "'You are very severe, Captain Bramble,' said the lady, "'upon a person whom you acknowledge you have not yet known a single calendar month.' "'It is long enough, quite long enough, Miss Huntington, "'to read the character of such an unprincipled fellow "'as this nondescript captain.' "'I have known him about twice as long as you, Captain Bramble,' "'replied Miss Huntington calmly, "'and I have not only formed a very different opinion of him, "'but have good reasons to feel satisfied "'of the correctness of my judgment.' "'I perceive that Miss Huntington has taken him under her protection.' replied the discomfited officer, sarcastically, as he seized his hat and left her. While in this spirit, the two rivals met in the open space before the house of Don Leonardo, when the English officer vented some coarse and scurrilous remarks upon Captain Ratlin, whose eyes flashed fire, and who seized his traducer by the throat, and bent him nearly double to the earth, with an ease that showed his superior physical strength to be immense. But as though impressed with some returning sense, Captain Ratlin released his grasp and said, "'Rise, sir. You are safe from my hand. But fortunate it is for you that you can call this lady whose name you have just referred to friend. The man whom she honors by her countenance is safe from any injury I can inflict.' "'A very chivalric speech,' replied the enraged and browbeaten officer. "'But you shall answer for this, sir, and at once. "'This is not the spot. "'You must give me satisfaction for this base insult, "'or by the heaven above us I will shoot you like a dog.' "'As you will, sir. "'I have spoken openly, and I shall abide my word. "'I am no boaster, nor do I expect any especial favor "'at the hands of the lady whom you have named. "'But I repeat, sir, that my respect for her renders her friend safe from any injury that I might otherwise, in just indignation, inflict. Little did either know that the object of their remarks had been a silent but trembling witness of the entire scene, from the first taunting word Captain Bramble had spoken. Early the subsequent morning, even before the sun had risen, a boat might have been seen pulling from the side of the English sloop of war, propelled by the stout arms of a couple of seamen, while two persons sat in the stern, a closer examination of whom would have revealed them to be the captain of the ship and surgeon. At the same moment there shot out from a little nook or bay in the rear of the barracoons a light skiff propelled by a single oarsman, who rowed his bark in true seaman style, cross-handed, while a second party sat in the stern. The rower was Captain Ratlin and his companion was the swarthy and fierce-looking Don Leonardo. That the same purpose guided the course of either boat was apparent from the fact that both were headed for the same jutting point of land that formed a sort of cape on the harbor's southern side. "'That is the fellow, he who pulls the oars,' said Captain Bramble to his surgeon. "'He must be a vulgar chap, and pulls those instruments as though bred to the business.' "'Not so very vulgar, either,' said the other. "'The fellow has seen the world, and has his notions of honor, and knows how to behave. That is plain enough.' "'Egad! He shoots that skiff ahead like an arrow. The fellow could make his fortune as a ferryman,' continued the surgeon, facetiously. "'Give way, lads, give way,' said the English captain, impatiently, to his men, as he saw that the skiff would reach the point long before he got there himself. A short half-hour found the two rivals standing opposite to each other at some twelve paces' distance, each with a pistol in his hand. The preliminaries had been duly arranged between the surgeon and Don Leonardo, the latter of whom had not ceased up to the last moment to strive and effect a reconciliation. Not that he dreaded bloodshed, it was a pastime to him, but because it jarred so manifestly with his interest to have his friend run the risk of his life. Both of the principals were silent. Captain Bramble was exceedingly red in the face, and evidently felt the bitterness of anger still keenly upon him, 
while the open manly features of his opponent wore the same placid aspect as had characterized them while he leaned over the side of his own ship or gazed idly into the rippling waters that laved the dark hull it had been arranged that both parties should aim and fire between the commencement and end of pronouncing the words one two three by the surgeon and that individual having placed his box of instrument with professional coolness upon the ground took his position to give the signal agreed upon when he said in a preparatory tone gentlemen are you ready to which both answered by an inclination of the head and then immediately one two three almost before the first word was fairly articulated the sharp quick report of captain bramble's pistol was heard and the next moment he was observed gazing intently upon his adversary to see whether he had wounded him and observing that he had not he dashed his weapon to the ground uttering a fierce oath at his luck in the meantime captain ratlin had not moved an inch not even a muscle his hand containing the pistol had hung quietly at his side and his face still remained undisturbed he had kept his word and would not fire upon the friend of the woman whom he truly respected and earnestly devotedly though hopelessly loved captain bramble paced back and forth like a caged lion until at last coming opposite and near to his adversary he coarsely remarked it is a much easier for a trembling hand to retain a perpendicular position than to assume a horizontal one captain ratlin understood the taunt and stepping to where the english officer had thrown his discharged weapon he threw it high in the air and at the exact moment when the power of gravitation turned the piece towards the earth he quickly raised his arm and fired sending the bullet in his own pistol completely through the wooden stock of the other then turning coolly to captain bramble he said a trembling hand sir is hardly so sure of its aim as that this fellow is the evil one himself whispered the surgeon to his principal come let us on board if he should insist upon its second shot we should be obliged to give him the chance since he did not fire at you and he would drop you spite of fate curse his luck i am sure i had him full in the breast such a miss and i who am so sure at a dozen paces and the english officer continued to chafe and growl until he had got into his boat and was out of hearing from the shore captain ratlin and don leonardo quietly pulled back towards the barracoons and as they neared the shore they saw the form of a female which both at once recognized to be that of miss huntington who stood there pale as death and who gazed intently at the young commander as he drew nearer and nearer and as he jumped upon the shore said hastily you have been on a fearful errand have either of you been hurt nay lady it was but a bit of morning sport said captain ratlin pleasantly answer me was he injured for i see you are not there has been no harm done to flesh and blood lady heaven be praised said the half-fainting girl as she leaned upon the young commander's proffered arm and they together approached the house of don leonardo there had been another witness of the affair one who was secreted on the very spot where the meeting took place one who had overheard the arrangements for the same and one who had secretly repaired thither with hopes to have seen the blood of one if not both flow even unto death and this was maud poor deluded revengeful girl who had permitted one passion to fill her every thought and who now lived and dreamed only for revenge upon one who was as innocent of any intended slight or wrong to her as he was to the being he really loved maud with the fleetness of an antelope had ran by the land path from the spot of the contest and reached home nearly as quick as the boat containing her father and captain ratlin had done and now as she saw her hated white rival leaning upon his arm so pale so confiding and he addressing her with such tender assurance a fresh wound to her already rankled and goaded feelings was imparted and once more she swore a fearful and quick revenge captain bramble too much chagrined to make his appearance at least for a few days did not soon land from his vessel 
but mused alone in the solitude of his cabin upon the obduracy of Miss Huntington's heart, and the good luck which had saved his rival's life. End of chapter 10 Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida Chapter 11 of The Sea Witch this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Lennon The Sea Witch by Maturin Murray Ballou Chapter 11 The Hues of Love Captain Bramble did not long remain contented on board his ship. This he could not do while he realized that Miss Huntington was so near upon the shore, for so far as such a being could really love, he did love the lady, and yet his sentiment of regard was so mixed up with selfishness and bitterness of spirit, and pride at being refused, that the small germ of real affection which had found birth in his bosom was too much corroded with alloy to be identified. He felt that he had been overreached by Captain Ratlin, and also that he had good grounds of suspecting his successful rival of being either directly or indirectly engaged in the illegal trade of the coast, and determined, if possible, to discover his secret. He again became a frequent visitor of Don Leonardo's house, where he was sure to meet him constantly. There were two spirits whom we have introduced to the reader in this connection who were fitting companions for each other, but they had not as yet been brought together by any chance so as to understand one another. We refer to Captain Bramble and Maud the Quadroon. Both now hated Captain Ratlin, and would gladly have been revenged in any way for the gratification of their feelings upon her whom he so fondly loved. With this similarity of sentiment, it was not singular that they should ere long discover themselves and feelings to each other. Indeed, Maud, who had been a secret witness of the deed, already realized that Captain Bramble was the enemy of him whom she had once loved, and whom she now so bitterly despised. Untutored in the ways of the world and fashionable intrigue, yet the quadroon saw very clearly that through Captain Bramble she might consummate that revenge which she had so signally failed in doing by the agency of the hostile negro tribes she had treacherously brought to her father's door. He had not been long at the factory, therefore, on landing after the duel, before Maud sought a private interview with him, on pretext of communicating to him some information that should be of value to him in connection with his official duty. To this, of course, the English officer responded at once, shrewdly suspecting at least a portion of the truth, and therefore met Maud at an appointed spot in the jungle hard by her father's house. You will speak truly in what you tell me, my good girl, he said sagaciously, as he looked into her dark-spirited eyes with admiration he could not avoid. Have I anything to gain by a lie? responded Maud, with a curling lip. No, I presume not, he answered. I merely ask from ordinary precaution. But what do you propose to reveal to me? Something touching this Captain Ratlin? Aye, said the girl quickly. It is of him I would speak. You are an English officer agent of your government, and sent here to suppress this vile traffic? True. And have you suspected nothing since your vessel has been here? I suspect that this Captain Ratlin is in some way connected with the trade. He is, and but now awaits the gathering of a cargo in my father's barracoons, to sail with them to the West Indies. It is not his first voyage, either. But where is his vessel? He cannot go to sea without one, said the Englishman. That is what I would reveal to you. I will discover to you his ship if you swear to arrest him, seize the vessel, and if possible hang him. You are bitter indeed, said the officer, almost startled at the fiendish expression of the quadroon's countenance as she emphasized those two expressive words. I have reason to be, answered Maud, calming her feelings by an effort. Has he wronged you? Yes, he loves the white woman whom he brought to my father's house. Thus far, at all events, my good girl, we have mutual cause for hate, 
and we will work heartily together. You know where his vessel lies? I do. Is it far from here? Less than a league. Indeed, these fellows are cunning, mused the officer. When will you guide me and a party of my people thither? Tonight. It is well. I will be prepared. Where shall we meet? At the end of the cape, where you and he met a few days since. Where we met? asked the other, in surprise. How knew you of that? I saw it. The duel? Yes. It is strange. I thought none but ourselves were to be there. He has moved in no direction since this woman has been here that I have not followed. There I hope to see him fall. But he was strangely preserved. You are a singular girl, Maud, replied the officer. Take this and wear it for my sake, he added, unloosing a fine gold chain from his watch and tossing it around her neck and be punctual at that spot tonight after the last ray of twilight. I will, answered the quadroon, as she regarded the fine workmanship of the chain for a moment with idle and childlike pleasure. Then, turning from the spot, they both returned, though by different paths, from the jungle towards the dwelling of her father. Captain Bramble dined with Don Leonardo that day, and his good spirits and pleasant converse were afterwards the subject of comment, exhibiting him in a fair, more favorable light than he had appeared in since his arrival at the factory. Maud, too, either for the sake of disguise, or because the knowledge of her plan imparted exhilaration of spirits to her, was more agreeable, seemingly frank and friendly, than she had been for many a long day. If we accept the day before the late attack of the negroes upon the house, when the same treacherous assumption of cheerfulness and satisfaction with all parties was similarly assumed. Captain Ratlin, on his part, was ever the same. He found that he must wait some weeks, even yet, before he could prosecute the purpose of his voyage, and indeed he seemed to have lost all interest in it. His thoughts were full of too pure an object to permit him to participate to any extent in so questionable a business. Gladly would he at any moment have thrown up his charge of the sea witch, and he had indeed promised Miss Huntington that for her sake, and in honor of her friendship, for he had never aspired to any more intimate relationship, he would ignore the trade altogether, and that he would dispatch Mr. Faulkner, his first officer, to the owners in Cuba with the ship he had himself taken in charge. Having been brought up from childhood upon the sea, he had never studied the morality of the trade in which he was now engaged. But the nice sense of honor, which was so strong a characteristic of his nature, only required the gentle influence of a sweet and refined nature, like her with whom Providence had so opportunely thrown him, to reform him altogether of those rougher ideas which he had naturally imbibed in the course of his perilous and daring profession. In the presence of that fair and pure-minded girl, he was as a child, impressible and ready to follow her simplest instructions. All this betokened a native refinement of soul, else he could never have evinced the pliability which had rendered him so pleasant and agreeable a companion to her he secretly loved. Lady, he said to her as they sat together that afternoon, heaven has sent you for a guardian angel to me. Your refining influence has come to my heart at its most lonely, its most necessary moment. I have done with this trade, never more to engage in it. That is honorable, noble in you, Captain Ratlin, so promptly to relinquish all connection with a calling, which, though it affords fortune and command, can never permit you self-respect. The ship will probably be dispatched within these two weeks and then I will take any berth in legitimate commerce where I may win an honorable name and reputation. There is my hand on so honorable a resolution, said Miss Huntington, frankly, while a single tear of pleasure trembled in her clear, lustrous eyes. The young commander took the hand respectfully that Waits extended to him, but when he raised his eyes to her face and detected that tear, a thought for a moment ran through his brain a faint shadow of hope that perhaps she loved him, or might at some future time do so, and bending over the fair hand he held, he pressed it gently to his lips. He was not repulsed, nor chided, 
but she delicately rose and turned to her mother's apartment. How small a thing's will affect the whole tenor of a lifetime. Trifles lighter than straws are levers in the building up of destiny. Captain Ratlin turned from that brief interview with a feeling he had never before experienced. The idea that Miss Huntington really cared for him, beyond the ordinary interest that the circumstances of their acquaintances had caused, had not thus far been entertained by him. Had this been otherwise, he would doubtless have differently interpreted many agreeable tokens which she had granted him, and to which his mind now went back eagerly to recall, and consider under the new phase of feeling which actuated him. How else could he interpret that tear, but as springing from a heart that was full of kindly feeling towards him? It was a tell-tale drop of crystal that glistened but one moment there. Could it have been fancy? Was it possible he could have been mistaken? The matter assumed an aspect of intense importance in his estimation, and he paced the apartment where she had left him alone, half in doubt, half hoping. In one instant, how different an aspect all things were. Life, its aims, the persons he met at the door as he now passed out. Even the foliage seemed to partake of the freshness of his spirit, and the world to become rejuvenated and beautified in every aspect in which he could view it. This was the bright tide of the picture which his imagination, aided by that gaudy painter and fancy colorer, Hope, had conjured up before his mind's eye. But the reverse side of the picture was at hand, and now he paused to ask himself seriously, Can this be? Who am I? A poor unknown sailor, fortuneless, friendless, nameless. Who is she? A lady of refined cultivation, high family, wealth, and beauty. Is it likely that two such persons as I have considered should be joined by intimate friendship? Can such barriers as these be broken down by love? Alas, I am not so blind, so foolish, so unreasonable, as to believe it for a moment. So once more the heart of the young commander was heavy within his breast. In the meantime, Captain Bramble had found an opportunity that afternoon to see Maud, and to learn from her that Captain Ratlin almost always slept on board his ship, departing soon after dark for the spot through the jungle. Satisfied of this, Captain Bramble once more proceeded to make his arrangements for to have seized the vessel without her commander on board would have been to perform but half the business he had laid out for the night's engagement. But all seemed now propitious, and he awaited the darkness with impatience, when he might disembark a couple of boatloads of sailors and marines, and with the quadroon for guide follow the path to the jungle to where the sea witch lay. "'Why do you muse so long and lonely, my child?' asked Mrs. Huntington of her daughter that afternoon, as she came in and surprised her gazing out at a window vacantly. "'Oh, I hardly know, my dear mother. I was thinking over our strange fortune since we left Calcutta, the wreck, the nights in the boat, our fortunate rescue. "'Fortunate, my dear. I don't exactly know about that. Here we have been confined at this slave factory, little better than the slaves themselves, these four weeks. Well, mother, Captain Bramble says he shall sail soon, and then we can go round to Sierra Leone, and from thence take passage direct for England. For my part, I can't understand why Captain Bramble insists upon staying here so long. He doesn't seem to be doing anything. He came into the harbor by chance. He says that business and duty, which he cannot explain, detain him here but that he will soon leave, of which he will give us due notice. Heaven hasten the period, said the mother, impatiently, for I am most heartily tired and worn out with the strange life we lead here. This conversation will explain to the reader in part the reason why Mrs. Huntington and her daughter, English subjects, and in distress upon the coast, had not at once gone on board the vessel of their sovereign which lay in the harbor and been carried upon their destination. From the outset, Captain Bramble had resolved not to let his rival slip through his fingers by leaving port himself, and thus he had still remained to the present time, 
though without any definite plan of operation formed until he availed himself of Maud's proposal. "'Why, bless me, my child, you look as though you've been crying,' said the mother, now catching a glimpse at her daughter's face. "'Do I, mother?' she answered vacantly. This was just after she had returned from the meeting with Captain Ratlin, as already described, and whether she had been crying or not, the reader will probably know what feelings moved her heart. End of chapter 11 Recording by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico March 28, 2009Chapter 12 of The Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Lennon. The Sea Witch by Martin Murray Ballou. Chapter 12 The Conflict. Captain Bramble knew very well that he had desperate men to deal with in the taking of a slaver on the coast but he had gathered his evidence and witnesses in such a strong array that he felt warranted in going to any length in securing possession of a clipper craft which had been so fully described to him. He was not wanting in personal courage, and therefore, with a well-selected body of sailors and marines, and one or two officers, he quietly pulled away from the ship's side under cover of the night and landed at the proposed spot. Here he found Maud patiently waiting his coming, and ready to lead him to the hiding place of the sea witch and her crew. The men were all well armed and instructed how to act in any possible emergency that was to be met with in the business which brought them on shore. On the whole body pressed in silence through a tangled and narrow path, being more than once startled by the growl of some wild animal whose haunts they disturbed. It was weary struggling by this path through the wood but it was the only way to approach the desired point by land. Maud hesitated not, but stole or glided through the tangled undergrowth as though she had passed her whole lifetime in the deep, tangled ways of the jungle. As they went on, the moon gradually rose and lifted up the dark path by little gleamings, which stole in through the thick leaves and close-turning branches of the lofty vegetation. On and on they pressed, and now they paused at a sign from Maud, and listen to the sound of voices, which have a strange and echo-like sound in that wild and tangled spot. Hark! Those voices are not from the tongues of natives. That is English which they speak. Hist! Hist! whispered the quadroon. We are almost upon them. In which direction? asked the English officer. Here you see not through those bright, silver-like scales through the leaves? Yes. That is the river's bed, and they lie on board their craft, moored close to us. How many do they number? I know not. It is not important, continued the Englishman, turning to his followers, and in a low voice bidding them look to their weapons, for the game was near at hand. A few more steps brought the party to the skirts of the thicket, where it bordered on a small clearing, opening upon the river and looking across which, while they were themselves screened by the jungle, they discovered the dark hull of the sea witch with her lower masts and their standing rigging. The vessel was moored close to the shore, with which a portable gangway connected it. Shallow as the water was, yet so light was her draft that she evidently floated upon its sluggish current. Voices were heard issuing from the forehatch, and two or three petty officers were seated about the entrance to the cabin, smoking cigars and pipes, all unconscious of any danger. There is your prey. Spring upon it, and be quick, for they will fight like mad, and he will lay a dozen of you by the hills before you take the sea witch, said Maud. Captain Bramble rushed forward to the attack, followed by his men, and was soon on the deck of the vessel. But though he took Mr. Faulkner and his crew by surprise, he did not find them entirely unprepared and after dropping eight of his people upon the slaver's deck, and being himself severely wounded in the arm, Captain Bramble thought it best to beat a retreat, at least for a few moments, and so sought again the shelter of the jungle. The conflict, which was very brief, was also very sanguinary, 
and five of the sailor's people had been either mortally wounded or killed outright, but from the habit of constantly wearing their arms, even to pistols, when on the coast, they had been found in a very good situation at even the shortest notice for defending themselves. Captain Bramble now saw evident tokens of a purpose to unmoor the vessel and let her drift out into the river, which would at once place her beyond his reach, as he had no boats within a league of the spot, and therefore he resolved upon a second onslaught, and this time divided his men into three parts, one to board at the bows, one at the stern, and himself leading a dozen picked men at the waist. This division of his forces was the best maneuver he could possibly make, and succeeded admirably, since his own people outnumbered the slavers, and by dividing them he strengthened his own power and weakened theirs. Once more upon their deck, the hand-to-hand -hand battle was short, bloody, and decisive, until towards its close Captain Bramble found himself driven into the forecastle with a number of his followers, and at the same moment saw the mate of the sea witch, with those of his people that were left alive hastening to embark in a quarter-boat, and pull away from the vessel's side with great speed. A sort of instinct explained to him the meaning of this, and hurrying his people on shore with the wounded, they sought the shelter of the jungle once more. Scarcely had they gained the shade of the thick undergrowth, when a report like that of a score of cannons rang upon the night air, and high in the air soared a body of flame and wreck in terrific confusion. The slavers had placed a slow match in connection with the magazine, and had blown in one instant of time that entire and beautiful fabric into ten thousand atoms. Even Maud, with all her hatred and passion, quailed at the shock, and trembled as she crouched to the ground with averted face. She realized the result of her treachery, but looked in vain for the object on whom she had hoped to wreck the strength of her indignation and her hate. Where was he? This was a question that Captain Bramble had several times asked, but in vain, until now, when suddenly there appeared before their eyes, hastening towards the scene, Captain Will Ratlin. "'Seize him, my men! Seize him and bind his arms! He is our prisoner,' said the English officer. "'By what authority do you give such an order as that, Captain Bramble?' asked the young commander. "'In the Queen's name, sir, in the name of the English people who abhor pirates and slavers,' was the taunting reply from the Englishman. "'Stand back,' said Captain Ratlin, felling two seamen to the earth who approached him to lay hands upon his person, and at the same time drawing a revolver from his pocket. "'Stand back,' I say. "'I carry the lives of six of you in this weapon, and I am not one to miss my aim, as your valiant leader yonder well knows. Now, Captain Bramble, I will surrender to you, provided you accede to my terms. Otherwise, you cannot take me alive.' "'Well, sir, what have you to offer?' said the English officer, positively quailing before the stern and madly front of the young commander." that you accept my word of honor to obey your directions as a prisoner, but that you shall not bind my arms, or confine me otherwise. Have your own way, replied the Englishman doggedly, but give up your weapons. Do you promise me this, Captain Bramble? I do. It is well, sir. There goes my weapon, saying which he hurled it far into the river's bed. As soon as Maud saw him, she sprang to her feet, and with all the bitterness of expression which her countenance was capable of, she scowled upon his upright figure and handsome features. It was evident she felt a bitter disappointment at the absence from the late affray, and would only have rejoiced had she believed he was blown to atoms with his vessel by the wild explosion which had so lately shaken the very earth upon which she now stood. It was plain that up to this very moment, however, that the young commander had never expected her of treachery or even jealousy towards himself, but now he would have been worse than blind not to have seen and realized, also the deep malignant feeling that was written on her dark but handsome face. Maud, he said in a low but respectful tone, is it you who have betrayed us? I said the girl quickly, with a shrill cadence of voice, a double heart should be dealt doubly with. It was I who led these people hither, and I hoped the fate of so many of your ship's company might have been yours. But you are a prisoner now, and there's hope yet. Maud, Maud, have I ever wronged you or your father? asked Captain Ratlin reproachfully. 
Do you not love that white-faced girl you brought hither? And if I did, Maud, what wrong is that to thee? Did I promise thee love? Nay, I ask it not of you, said the angry girl. But you have done me a great wrong, Maud, one that you do not yourself understand. I forgive you, though, poor girl, you are hardly to blame. These kindly intended words only aggravated the object to whom they were addressed, and she turned away hastily to the shade of the thick vegetable growth, where he lost sight of her figure among the branches and leaves, while he walked on with the English officer and his people over the ground they had just passed towards Don Leonardo's. There, being now no further cause for secrecy, they marched openly, and enlivened the way with many a rude jest, which grated harshly upon the ears of the wounded, who were borne upon litters made from branches of the hard, dry leaves of the palm. As they came upon the open spot where stand the barracoons in Don Leonardo's dwelling, they found the entire family aroused and on the watch, the heavy explosion of the sea witch's magazine having seemed to them like an earthquake. Don Leonardo, who shrewdly suspected the truth, seemed satisfied at a single glance as to the state of affairs, and walking up to the young commander, and watching for a favorable opportunity, when not overheard, he asked significantly, Treachery? Yes. Whom? It matters not, was the magnanimous reply, for Captain Ratlin was too generous to betray the quadroon to her father, though she had proved thus treacherous to him. As he now recognized himself to be a prisoner, and had been told by Captain Bramble that he must go forthwith on board his ship as such, he desired to say a few words to Mrs. Huntington and her daughter, a request which his rival could hardly find grounds for refusing, and so he took occasion to explain to them the state of affairs, and to advise them to the best of his ability, touching their own best course in order to safely reach England. They felt that his advice was good, as truly disinterested, and both agreed to abide strictly by it, but doubted not that as Captain Ratlin had not been engaged in any slave commerce, and indeed had not been in the late action at all, that he would be very soon liberated, and free to choose his own calling. Captain Ratlin was conveyed on board the ship in the harbor, and Mrs. Huntington, with her daughter also, with Maud and with some other witnesses that Captain Bramble desired, and the vessel shaped her course along the coast towards Sierra Leone, where there was sitting an English court of admiralty. With extraordinary authority relative to such cases, Captain Bramble was now about to lay before them, and who would be only too much gratified at the bringing before them of an offender to make an example of him. Captain Bramble, of course, offered to Mrs. Huntington and her daughter his own cabin for their greater comfort, and strove to make their position as comfortable as possible for them while they were on board. But he had not the nice sense of honor, that true delicacy of spirit, which should have led him to remember they were his guests from necessity, and that to push a suit under such circumstances was not only indelicate, but positively insulting. And yet he did so. True, he did not actually importune Miss Huntington, but his attentions and services were all rendered under that guise and aspect which rendered them to her most repulsive. Captain Bramble took good care of his prisoner and rival, and should have no degree of intercourse with her whom he knew very well Captain Ratlin loved. Under pretense that he feared his prisoner would attempt to escape, he kept him under close guard, and did not permit him upon deck during the entire trip from the factory of Don Leonardo to the harbor of Sierra Leone. This chafed the young commander's spirit somewhat, but yet he was too true a spirit to sink under oppression. He was brave and cheerful always. Of course Miss Huntington saw and understood all this, and the more heartily despised the English officer for the part he played in the unmanly business. Maud kept by herself. She felt miserable, and as is often the case, realized that the success of her treachery thus far, which in her anticipation had promised so much, had but still more deeply shadowed her heart. The English officer looked upon her with mingled feelings of admiration for her strange beauty, with contempt for her treachery, and with the thought that she might be made perhaps the subject of his pleasure by a little management by and by. 
it was natural for a heart so vile as his to couple every circumstance and connection in some such selfish spirit with himself. It was like him. Maud, he said to her one day. Well, she answered, lifting her handsome face from her hands where she often hid it. You have lost one lover? The girl only answered by a flashing glance of contempt. How would you like another? Who, she said sternly. Me, answered Captain Bramble. You, she said contemptuously, with so much expression as to end the conversation. No, he had not rightly understood the quadroon. It was not wounded pride, that sentiment so easily healed once bruised in the heart of a woman. It was not that which moved the laughter of the Spanish sailor. It was either love, or something very like it, turned into actual hate, and the native power of her bosom for revenge seemed to be now the food upon which she sustained life itself. Taking her lonely place in the cabin, after the conversation just referred to, she again hid her face in her hands, and remained with her head bowed in her lap for a long, long while, half dreaming, half waking. Poor, untutored, uncivilized child of nature, she was very, very unhappy now. End of chapter 12 Recording by Todd Lennon, Albuquerque, New Mexico, March 29, 2009「of the Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Salome. The Sea Witch by Maturin Murray Ballou. Chapter 13. The Trial. At the immediate time of which we now write, there had been some very aggravated instances of open resistance to the English and American cruisers on the African station by the slavers who thronged the coast, and the home government had sent out orders embracing extraordinary powers, in order that the first cases that might thenceforth come under the cognizant of the court might lead to such summary treatment of the offenders, as to act as an example for the rest, and thus have a most salutary effect upon the people thus engaged. It was under these circumstances that Captain Will Ratlin found himself arraigned before the Maritime Commission at Sierra Leone, with a pretty hard case made out against him at the outset of affairs. The truth was, he had not been taken resisting the attack of Captain Bramble and his men, but his accusers did not hesitate to represent that he was thus guilty, and several were prepared, Maud among the rest, to swear to this charge. Indeed, Captain Bramble found that he had people about him who would swear to anything, and he had little doubt in proving so strong a case as to jeopardize even the life of his prisoner, since many of his crew had died outright in the attack upon the sea witch, to say nothing of the seriously wounded. All that could prejudice the court against the prisoner was duly paraded before the eyes and ears of the individual members, ere yet the case was brought legally before them, and at last when Captain Ratlin was formally brought into court, he was little less than condemned already in the minds of nine-tenths of the Marine Court. He was rather amazed to see and to hear the free way in which evidence was given against him, corroborating statements which amounted to the most unmitigated falsehoods, but above all to find Maud unblushingly declare that she saw him in the fight and that he shot with a pistol one of the men whose name had been returned as among the dead, and that he had wounded another. The girl avoided his eyes while she uttered her well-fabricated story, but had she met the eyes of the young commander, she would have seen more of pity there than of anger, more of surprise than of reproach even. But in the meantime, while these feelings were moving him, the case was steadily progressing, and began to wear a most serious aspect as it regarded the fate of Captain Will Ratlin there still remained one other witness to examine whose illness had kept him on board ship up to the last moment and who it was said could identify the prisoner as one of the party engaged in defending the deck of the slaver he was a servant of captain bramble's had attended his master in the attack but having received a blow from a handspike upon the head was rendered insensible at the first of the action and had been carried on board his ship in that condition from which state he had gradually recovered until it was thought he would be able to testify before the court at the present time after a few moments of delay the man made his appearance evidently not yet recovered from the fearful blow he had received but yet able to take his place at the witness's post and to perform the part expected of him no sooner had the court through its head addressed the witness than he answered promptly the preliminary queries put to him while the effect upon captain ratlin seemed to be like magic was it guilt that made him start so rub his eyes look about him so vaguely and then sitting down to cover his face with his hands only to go through the same pantomime again 
We ask, was it guilt that made him act thus? The judges noted it, and even made memorandums of the same upon the record of evidence. It was observed as significant also by every one present. Captain Bramble himself looked at the prisoner with surprise to see him thus affected by the presence of his servant. "'For the love of heaven!' exclaimed the prisoner aloud, as though he could bear this intensity of feeling no longer. "'Who is this man? It is my servant, an honest, faithful man, may it please the court. "'Leonard Hust, by name, born in my father's service,' said Captain Bramble. "'Leonard Hust!' mused the young commander thoughtfully. "'Leonard Hust!' "'I, sir,' added Captain Bramble, somewhat pertly. "'Do you find any objection to that name? If so, sir, I pray you will declare it to the court.' "'Leonard Hust,' still mused the prisoner, without noticing this interruption. "'There is a strange ring upon my ears in repeating that name.' "'Prisoner,' said the judge, "'do you recollect having done this man a severe and almost fatal harm in the late conflict?' "'Ay, ay,' said the young commander, somewhat confused in his mind from an evident effort to recall some long-forgotten association. "'You will be so good as to answer the question put by the court,' repeated the judge. "'The court will please remember that I hurt no one, and that I was not even engaged in the action referred to. These good people are mistaken.' Now it was that the attention of all were drawn towards Leonard Hust, who in turn seemed as much surprised and as much moved by some secret cause as the prisoner had been. He hastily crossed the court-room to where the prisoner sat, and looking full into his eyes, seemed to be for a moment entranced, while the court remained silent, observing these singular manifestations which they could not understand. "'Leonard, Leonard, I say,' repeated Captain Bramble, "'what trick is this?' "'Trick?' whispered the man. "'Trick, Captain Bramble? Tell me, sir, who is that man?' "'Why, they call him Captain Will Ratlin, and we know him to be a slaver.' The servant still hesitated, looking from the prisoner to his principal accuser, the English officer, then at the court, and finally drawing his master a little on one side. The man again went through the pantomime, described, and placing his mouth to his master's ear whispered something which startled him as though a gun had been fired at his very ear. The shock was like electricity, and made him stagger for support. Two or three times he repeated, "'Impossible! Impossible!' and finally begged the court to stay the proceedings, as he was taken suddenly ill, and should not be able to attend until to-morrow. Being the principal prosecutor and witness, of course his presence was requisite to the progress of the trial, and therefore, as he made this request, it was at once formally granted, and the court adjourned for the time, while the prisoner was remanded on shipboard for safekeeping until the next day. That the reader may understand the singular conduct of both the young commander and Leonard Hust, he must follow the latter worthy into his master's private room in the government house, where they proceeded at once after the occurrences described. "'In heaven's name, Leonard, what do you mean by such an assertion?' asked Captain Bramble, throwing himself into a chair and wiping the cold perspiration from his face. "'I mean, sir, that the man on trial to-day is no more nor less than your brother.' "'Charles Bramble?' "'Yes, sir. How strange is all this! How know you beyond all cavil, Leonard?' by the scar over the right eye. You gave it to him yourself. Don't you remember, sir, just previous the dog affair for which he ran away from home? By heaven! I believe you speak truly, and yet how strange, how more than strange it all is, that we should meet again in this way. It quite nonplussed me, sir. I thought he was a ghost at first. Strange, strange, mused the elder brother. In those days, long ago in our childhood, he crossed my path constantly, and here he is again, athwart my house. By heaven! But it is strange, wonderful, that fate should have thrown him and Helen Huntington together again, and that neither should know the other, and yet not so very strange, for she was but eight years old when Charles ran away. Yes, he thwarted me then, but even in childhood the girl fancied him above me, and now she affects him even in his fallen fortunes. "'What shall we do, sir, now that Master Charles has turned up again?' asked Leonard Huss in his simplicity. "'We cannot testify against him now, sir.' "'No, no, no,' said the elder brother hastily. "'He must not be further examined.' "'How he has altered, sir, only to think,' continued the servant. "'Why, when he went away from Bramble Park, sir, he wasn't much more than nine years old.' "'Yes, I remember, I remembered, Leonard,' replied his master hurriedly, while he walked the apartment with quick, irregular steps. "'I remember only too well.' This was indeed that elder brother who had, when a boy, so oppressed, so worried, and rendered miserable his brother Charles, as to cause him, in a fit of desperation, to stray away from home, whether he knew not.' His parents saw now, alas, too late, their fatal error. But the boy was gone, no tidings could be had of him, and they believed him dead. The honest tar, whose yarn the attentive reader will remember, as given on the deck of the sea witch, spoke truly of his commander. He had years before strayed alongside a vessel, as has been related, from whence he hardly knew himself, or was afraid to say. 
Hunger and neglect even then had greatly changed him, and he shipped, as has been related. The fall he got at sea threw a cloud over his brain as to past recollections up to that time, and here if the wish ever possessed him as to returning to his early home, he knew not of it. When he heard the voice of Leonard Hust in the court, it seemed to strike upon some string in memory's harp which vibrated to old familiar recollections, and the more he heard him speak the more sensation came over him, which led to the demonstrations which we have already witnessed. And yet he could not recall aught that would serve him as a clue. The early injury to his brain seemed to have obliterated the connecting links that memory could not supply. The reason, probably, why the servant's voice and not the brother's thus recalled him was that the former had been kind, and his voice had ever sounded like music in the neglected boy's ears, but the brother's voice had never had that charm or happy association connected with it. As to little cousin Helen, as she was then called, it was not strange that Miss Huntington, after years of estrangement in India, meeting him under such circumstances, himself so changed, should not have recalled enough of the past to recognize him. And yet we have seen that at times she dwelt upon the tender accents of his voice like sleeping memories, herself quite ignorant of the cause of this particular influence. She was now with her mother on shore at the mission house, in an agony of suspense as to the result of the trial which was taking place. She feared the worst, for Captain Bramble had taken measures to instruct those about her to their effect that the prisoner would be found guilty, and either strung up by the neck at once, or be sent home to England for the same purpose. Mrs. Huntington felt sad and borne down by the position of affairs, for although she did not understand her daughter's sentiments toward Captain Ratlin, yet she recognized the fact of her and her child's indebtedness to him, and that he had evinced the characteristics of a gentleman. "'Mother, if they find Captain Ratlin guilty, what can they, what will they do with him?' asked Helen Huntington anxiously of her mother on the day of the trial." why my dear it is terrible to think of but the penalty of such a crime as is charged to him is death but we must hope for the best and why helen how pale you look it was only a passing spasm mother i am i believe i am already better said the daughter in an agony of suffering that she dared not evince come helen lean on me and go to your bed for a while these sudden changes and so much exposure has rendered you weak come my dear come and the poor girl, all trembling and pale, suffered her mother to lead her to her chamber, where a gentle anodyne soothed her nerves, and she soon fell to sleep. Had her mother not been a little better than blind, she would have easily read her daughter's heart, and have seen that she loved with all her woman's soul the man who was that day on trial for his life. What mattered it to her that he was nameless, a wanderer, a slaver? She loved him, and that covered each and all faults, however heinous the sight of the law." she felt that it was not the outward associations which made a man. She had looked beneath the surface of his soul, and had seen the pure crystal depth of his manly heart, frank, open, and as truthful as day itself. To her he was noble, chivalric, and true, and if all the world had blamed him, if all had called him guilty, her bosom would have been open to receive him. Could he have realized this as he lay in the chains on board his elder brother's ship? Could he have known that he was really loved by that fair, sweet, and gentle creature, how it would have lightened the weight of the iron bands he bore, how cheered his drooping spirits. End of chapter 13 Recording by Karen Salome Chapter 14 of The Sea Witch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elliot Miller The Sea Witch by Maturin Murray Ballou Chapter 14 The Brothers Now commenced a struggle in the bosom of Robert Bramble. It was some hours before he could recover from the first blush of amazement at the strange discovery he had made. Not to have had something of a brother's feelings come over him at such a time, he must have been less than human, and it was between the promptings of blood, of early recollections of childhood, before he grew to the age when his disposition, ruined by indulgence, had led him so bitterly to oppose and injure his brother as to drive him from the home of their youth. And the recollections of those little more matured years, when jealousy, at his superior aptness, strength and success with cousin Helen, had made him hate him. It was impossible for the man to forget the bitterness of the child. Besides, 
Had not the same spirit of rivalry ripened until he found his brother in manhood still his successful rival with Helen Huntington? The reader will remember that they had all three been children together, and that the last time Charles had looked back at his home, as he started away from it, his eye detected the little form of Helen, where she stood gazing after him. If there had been any better promptings in the heart of Robert Bramble, they would have turned the balance in favor of his brother, and he would have befriended him. But this he did not do. He walked his room, bitterly musing upon the singular position of affairs, while he knew very well that Charles lay in chains on board his ship in the harbor. Then he recalled the memory of his parents. The father was dead. The mother, a weak-minded woman, was also bowed by ill health. Indeed, their early lives had few happy associations. Robert himself had embittered all its relations. It was nearly midnight, and the moon had sunk behind the hill that sheltered the harbor on the north, leaving the dark water of the bay in deep shadow. At long gunshot from the shore lay the ship in which Charles Bramble was confined. All was still as death, save the pace of the sentinel in the ship's waist and a ripple now and then of tideway against the ship's cable. An observant eye, from the leeward side of the ship, might have seen a dark form creep out from one of the quarter ports, and gradually make its way along the molding of the water lines towards the larboard bow ports, of which it stealthily entered. Entering with this figure, we shall soon find it to be Leonard Hust, who now, watching an opportunity, slipped into the apartment where the young commander had been confined since he left the factory of Don Leonardo. No sooner was the door closed quietly, so as to avoid the observation of the watch between decks, than the newcomer opened a secret lantern and discovered himself to the prisoner, at the same time cautioning him to silence. "'Who are you?' coolly asked Charles Bramble, for thus we must know him in future. Then it hust, was the reply, your friend, as I will soon prove. But it is only a few hours since you were giving witness against me. That is true, but bless you, sir, there has been a great change in matters since then. So I thought, by the movements I observed, though I did not understand them. Hist! Speak low, sir, said the other, and while I am talking to you, just let me, at the same time, be filing off these steel ornaments upon your wrists. File them off? Well, then, you must, indeed, be a friend," said the prisoner. Leave me to prove that. Sit here so the light will fall on them, with your back this way. That will keep the light from showing between decks. So, that's it. But what was it that made your voice and the sound of your name affect me so this morning? I could not divest myself of the feeling that I had heard it somewhere before. Heard it? Bless you, sir. I'd rather think you'd heard it before," said the fellow, as he worked industriously with his file upon the handcuffs. Well, where and when, and under what circumstances? asked the prisoner, curiously. That's just what I'm going to tell you, sir. And you see, Master Charles— Master Charles? Charles, why do you call me by that name? Why, you see, that is your name, to be sure, Charles Bramble, and you are Captain Robert Bramble's brother. And take care, hold still, or the file will cut you. How do not trifle with me. What is this which you are telling me? Indeed, sir, indeed, it is all true, said the other, half frightened at the effect his words had produced upon the prisoner who now stepped away from him and stood aloof, withdrawing his wrist from the operation which Leonard Hust was performing. "'Come hither, Leonard Hust, if that be your name,' he said. "'Sit here and tell me what this business is that you refer to. No blind hints, sir, but speak out plainly and like a man.' Thus interrogated, the man did as he was directed, and went on to tell the commander of the Sea Witch his story up to the time when he was lost to his parents and friends, how he had never been kindly treated by his eldest brother, 
who, indeed, drove him from his home by his incessant oppression. He referred to that last gallant act he had performed by saving his mother's favorite dog, and how little cousin Helen, she is the same as Miss Huntington, had seen it all, and had thanked him over and over again for it. And a thousand other reminiscences, thread by thread and link by link, filling up the space from earliest childhood to the hour when he had left his home at Bramble Park. As he went on, relating these things, in the same old natural voice that he had poured into the same ears from their infancy, until nearly ten years had passed, a long closed vein of memory seemed gradually to open in the prisoner's brain. He covered his face with his hands, and for a few moments seemed lost in connecting the various threads of the past, until gradually it all came plainly and clearly back to him. His memory had again by these hints become completely restored, and he was himself again. "'Leonard, Leonard, I see all, I remember all,' he said, while a tear, a man's tear, wet for a single moment his bronze cheek. "'I am rejoiced, sir, to hear it, I am sure,' said the other. "'But, Leonard, where is my brother? And why is it necessary to remove these badges of shame by stealth? Tell me, where is Robert?' Alas, sir, you must remember that he never held a brother's regard for you. It was the very thing which drove you from us when you were a wee bit of a boy. True, true, but he must see the hand of providence in all this, and I know he will give me his hand, and we will forgive each other and forget the past. Alas, sir, I always befriended you at home when Master Robert had set both the old folk against you, and I would do so now. But as to him, sir, I'm sorry to say it, but he's a bad man, and he makes all those who are with him bad men. And I have many a sad thing at heart that I have been guilty of by following his orders, sir. No, no, Master Charles, take my advice. Don't trust Robert. Make your escape, or you will be hanged at the yardarm of this very ship ere another twenty-four hours have passed. "'Is he capable of this?' asked the younger brother, in tones of amazement. "'Nobody should know better than I, sir, and I tell you yes.' "'My blood, then, shall not be upon his hands,' said Charles, musing. "'I will escape. Come, good Leonard. Relieve me of these shackles, and quickly.' "'Slowly, slowly, Master Charles. We must be cautious. There are watchful eyes on board the ship, and sentries who know their duty.' so be wary. The young commander seemed now to stand more erect. There was a freer glance to his eye. His lips were more compressed and firm. He felt that what had to been to him heretofore as an indelible stain, a stigma upon his character, was now effaced. He was not only respectably born, but even gently and highly so. His father was knighted by the king. His blood was as pure and ancient as any in England. He could now take Helen Huntington to his heart without shame. He could boldly plead a cause that he had not before dared to utter. He could refer to her to the dear hours of their childhood, to the tender kiss she gave him when he left that distant home to become a wanderer over half the globe. He no longer felt the irons that Leonard Hust was filing away. He seemed to feel a strength that would have snapped them like a pack threp. He was a man now, a free man, and not a thing of accident, a thing for the world to point at in scorn, n nor an abandoned child of shame. No, he felt nerved at once by this singular, this almost miraculous discovery, and could hardly restrain his impatience. Yet a shadow for the moment crossed over his brow, as he thought of that brother, who could coldly look and see him sacrificed knowing what he must and surely did know. Could he have permitted such a result, had he been in Robert's place? Indeed, he felt he could not. Does my brother know that you are here on this errand, Leonard? If he did, it would cost me my life, said the honest fellow. Charles would have placed some favorable construction upon the case, but alas, he could not. There was no possible way of disguising the matter. 
Robert was the same bitter, jealous-spirited soul that had rendered his childhood miserable. Time had not improved him. It was his nature and could not be eradicated. Charles now realized this, and within a few further inquiries of Leonard, touching matters of vital interest to him, he resolved not to seek Robert, as he had at the outset intended. Neither would he avoid him. He knew no other person save him could bring a continuance of the suit against him, but he hardly feared that even he would do that. Of course, Helen Huntington knows nothing of this development yet, Leonard. No, sir, and Master Robert bid me be careful not to let her find it out, or to say one word about the matter to any one whatever. I wonder the lady didn't know you, sir. You forget that even Robert did not recognize me. And that, too, seemed funny to me. Why, sir, I seemed to know you the instant I set eyes upon you in the court, and when I got close, I soon settled the doubt in my mind. Well, my good fellow, it seems that but for you I might have been hanged, and that, too, by my own brother. But I trust all is set right now? I hope so, sir. Only you must not let Master Robert know that I liberated you from these ruffles, sir. Will you, Master Charles? Never fear me, Leonard. I shall not do as you are about to do towards me, give testimony that will in any way criminate you. But I wasn't, sir, of my own free will. Only Master Robert had told me what I must say, and stick to it, and swear to it through thick and thin, and I am afraid not to obey him. Poor fellow! I see you are indeed his tool. But if I find myself in any sort of position ere long, I will take care to make your situation more comfortable. Thank you, sir, said Leonard Hust, just as the last shackle dropped from the prisoner's wrists. In the meantime, let us turn for a moment to the bedside of Captain Robert Bramble, for it is long past midnight, and, weary in mind and body, he had retired to that rest which he most certainly needed. But sleep is hardly repose for the guilty, and he was trebly so. Phantoms of all imaginable shapes flitted across his brain, pictures of suffering, of misery, and of danger, to all of which he seemed to be exposed, and from which he had no power to flee. Alas, how fearful the shadows that haunt a bad man's pillow! He writhed like one in physical pain, tossed from side to side, while the cold perspiration stood in big drops upon his brow and temples. Now his dreams carry him back, far back a score of years, to his childhood at Bramble Park, when all was innocence, and then, with leaping strides, he finds himself, years after, even as today, bearing deadly witness against his brother. His dead father seems standing by his bedside, pointing at him a warning finger, and sadly chiding his fearful want of feeling. He tosses and turns, and rises again, then, leaping from the uneasy bed, looks bewildered around, and half grows alarmed. Quickly he wraps a dressing-gown about him, and hastily walks back and forth to still the agony of feeling and the bitter phantoms of his dreams. How haggard and wild he looks by that dim candlelight! Once more he throws himself upon his bed, and, after a while, is again asleep, if such unconsciousness can be called sleep. Again he tosses and turns, and sighs like one in a nightmare, until at last, toward the breaking of day, the quick, startling breathing ceases, and subsides into a regular and equal respiration, and he lies still. Nature overcomes all else, and now he sleeps, indeed, but not until he has passed through a fearful purgatory of dreams, all too real, too trying. His brother, with soon the prospect of a disgraceful death on the gallows, had not suffered thus. No, he was repentant for the wrong he had done, and had already resolved to completely reform if the opportunity were offered to him. But Robert Bramble was outraging the laws of nature and of God. End of chapter 14